So, hi everyone, and welcome to Japanese Philosophy Talk 2. This is uh, co organized by the um, European Network of Japanese Philosophy and Kelas Isolasi Indonesia. Uh, from this talk to onwards, I decided to have Kelas Isolasi crew control the um, technical issues. So, the waiting room, you started to have jazz music, which was significant improvement since the last time. Uh, hey, uh, Sheriff, can you say a word about the Kelas Isolasi? What do you guys do? Uh, yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sharif. Uh, hello, uh, Maurice Atosang. Hello, Carlos. Yeah, so uh, we are from Indonesia and uh, we start this from uh, last year. It's about 20th of March uh, 2020 since uh, the start of pandemic in Indonesia. And we have a, a numerous class uh, and we already have 134 classes in one year and maybe two months. And uh, we are very glad to have a collaboration here with European Network of Japanese Philosophy. Uh, and we'll continue with uh, another program next week with philosophy and manga. Yeah, maybe uh, maybe we can spread uh, philosophy for uh, around the world. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we're right, trying to pick up. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry? So for me, maybe we will start this discussion. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Um, also, this is actually live streaming on YouTube through the Kelas Isolasi uh, YouTube channel. So if yeah. you have any friends that couldn't make it uh, because of time difference. Uh, I don't know why Carlos decided to do this because the American continent is like a four or five o'clock right now. <laughs> That's where you are, right, Carlos? Uh, yes, 5 a.m. Mm -hmm. So we are going to uh, start this Japanese philosophy talk two on Nishitani Keiji um, because Carlos wrote a dissertation on Nishitani. He's been translating Nishitani's text into Spanish through the European Journal of Japanese Philosophy. but. Can you start uh, this session? Uh, so basic role is like, if you have any questions, you just hit the, um, what is it, raise hand button, and then we point you and you'll be able to uh, ask question directly to Carlos or um, on that, that, that time, please turn on uh, your microphone at least. If you can turn on camera, that'd be great. But if you can't, uh, you can just write on chat. Uh, we will read your questions for you. Uh, so to start this session, Carlos, can you introduce yourself a little bit and also how you came to study uh, Nishitani Keiji and also a little bit of introduction of who he is and why he's great? Well, uh, first of all, well, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Takeshi. Thank you very much, ENOJP and Kelasi Solasi for the opportunity to, to talk to you today. Uh, I was really looking forward to it, and uh, well, it's yeah, it's five a.m. now. Five, well, past five past five in Bogota. So well, I was I was also having <laughs> honestly, I had some dreams that I was I was getting late. <laughs> so that that was my night, waking up and dreaming that I was I was late for for. For today, but mm -hmm. well, those are those are the things that that you have to 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 deal with if you want to work on Japanese philosophy and you reside in the American continent. So, part mm -hmm. of that's part of life. So it's fine. And <laughs> uh, well, so yeah, it's not it's not 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 the, the the first time I have to wake up early in the morning, four a.m., five a.m. Because sometimes you have to take a flight, and it's the only the only the only option available. So well, not the first time I've experienced this. And I'm really glad to be here. And well, as um, well, your question was how I started in Japanese philosophy, right? Yes. Uh, well, to and make how a, you a came most... to uh, how you came to Nishitani, Nishitani. yeah, specifically. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, to to make a long story short, I. When I just when I I st started studying, well, I was like a year after st uh, my, starting my my philosophy studies at university. That was back in two thousand and two when I no two thousand and three when I started. Mm 
And then, well, actually it was around those days, I, I decided I wanted to, to, to know more about Buddhism at first. It was a personal, a personal experience that led me to Buddhism but I realized that I wouldn't have much time to dedicate to Buddhism. So I decided I could somehow uh, read on, uh, about Buddhist philosophy first because I was starting philosophy studies. And well, I, I've experienced and by talking to others, I've realized that if you want to study Buddhist philosophy, you quickly end up reading Kyoto school philosophy. And so I, I landed on Nishida first. And, and then, well, I read here and there, I read some pages from the Pali Canon. I read some comments on the, on the Pali Canon. And then I, I, I read Nishida and inquire, inquiry, into the, uh, inquiry mm -hmm. into the good. Usually that's the, the, the place where you, where you end up. And in 2005, I think it was, well, I used to, when I was a student, uh, when I was doing my, my undergrad, I, I used to, to roam around my library, my university's library, just to, to, to see what, what was there. And uh, once I was in, in one of the shelves, it was about the, the, the religion and philosophy, or well, it was just the religion shelf. And I, I, I wanted to read what uh, I, I, I one of the books caught my attention. It was a, a selection of, of um, readings uh, on religion and religious texts from several traditions. But right next to it, there was a book um, with a black cover. Some of those hard uh, hard covers um, that some libraries put on books. In this case, it was because probably the the the, the paper cover was was damaged. So it was not easy to, 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 to hint which book that was. It just said religion and nothingness. And then I just picked it. And I realized then that the author was part of the Kyoto school. And I got very enthusiastic. I, I just read the, the first few pages. And I think I, I got stuck on the first few pages for a few years because I was mm -hmm. very enthusiastic about the content mm -hmm. there. Then I continued the book. Mm -hmm. And since then I, I haven't stopped. Then life, life is interesting because- uh, <laughs> Life is interesting. You're yeah, now waking up five in the morning just, talking yeah. about it, yeah. <laughs> it was kind of an accident. Yeah, it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the thing. I, I picked that book in back in 2005. Mm -hmm. And so far uh, I haven't abandoned Nishtani. And was every it, uh, time Was I it the library, library in Bogota, Colombia? Yes. Okay. National, yeah. the National University of Columbia. Okay, that's the library. Um, that you're... Yeah. Can and you well, uh, maybe I maybe quickly that's... maybe yeah maybe quickly can you introduce like Nishitani to some of us, some of us know nothing about Nishitani or never heard about him before, uh, maybe in the context of Kyoto's philosophy yeah. and what he represents, and then I'm going to open the floor for questions and see where he takes us. But can you introduce a little bit about Nishitani? Yes. Okay. Well, Nishitani was born in 1900 in, in, uh, in Western Japan and he, he died in 1919. So he lived over 90 years mm -hmm. and um, he was one of the main disciples, one of the most recognized um, students of Nishida Kitaro, the, the uh, so-called founder of the Kyoto school. And among, uh, along with, with uh, Tanabe Hajimi is considered one of the three main representatives of the school. Well, now I think it's not exactly the way they should be presented because now I, I believe that others like um, Niki Kiyoshi or Tosaka Jun, um, Mutai Risaku, for example, deserve a, a better representation. They deserve to be read more, more and translated more, more extensively. But well, anyway, um, so he had a, Nishitani was, was um, he had he had several several issues in 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 his teenage years. He was uh, constantly preoccupied with uh, with problems related to the meaning of life. 
which later he identified with nihilism. Um, precisely in his in his uh, youth years, in his years of youth, he 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 uh, was fond of, of reading Nietzsche, especially the the Zarathustra. He said he had a copy of the, of the Nietzsche Zarathustra with him, like a Bible. Um, and it was a little later that he found a book by Nishida. He decided he wanted to study with him. He went to Kyoto University and started formal studies in philosophy. And as time passed by, he found answers to his uh, nihilistic questions. Um, and later you see that nihilism is still a very important topic in, in his philosophy, especially in the 1940s and 1950s. But, um, well, the topic seems to disappear later. Um, and some people, some people actually claim that um, Nishitani's later philosophy is more focused on Zen and the standpoint of Zen than in nihilism. I still think there is, there is, some, there is significant continuity in Nishitani's work, but we can discuss that later. Yeah. Uh, but yes, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very, very long-standing career. He started writing in the 1930s and his mm -hmm. last texts um, were, were penned in the 1980s. So about half a decade of writing, mm -hmm. very rich, yeah. very, a very, uh, also uh, he, he covers a lot of topics and, and he mm -hmm. covers it in a way that can, that require from, from Western audiences a little patience because he doesn't go straight to the point he takes a certain topic and then he takes a lot of detours and goes around the topic. You yeah. end up talking about a lot of things and you, when you realize, okay, but where is, where is the main topic? I came here mm -hmm. for this or for that, but then you see it again at some point and another point and another point throughout his, his writing. And he used to talk like that as long as I, as I can see. His speeches were also designed this way, organized this way. But precisely because of that, he, he doesn't just, because he doesn't take you to the point, he provides you with, with a wider perspective from mm -hmm. which to address a very deep philosophical problems. And I, I really admire that. Yeah, I, I have many questions to ask, but I'm gonna reframe myself. Uh, I'm gonna open the stage, uh, I, but I, you're right that there, there are strong element of existential reflections on the question of the meaning of life or, or more specifically, the problem of nihilism uh, in early works of Nishitani. And then it's sort of carried over to the later one as well, that he's trying to respond to some of the earlier questions. But you're right, the language is different. But um, I would say, though, that from the founding members of Kyoto School, he's one of the most beautiful writers. Uh, so if you read yeah. Nishida and Tanabe, there are specific ways in which they write. They're not necessarily... necessarily um, you know, good example of good writing to me. Uh, but when you read Nishitani, it seems like it's, it's, it's a good writing. Uh, so I definitely recommend many uh, people to actually read Nishitani if you can't really enjoy Nishida and Tanabe. Uh, so on that note, I'd like to actually open the, um, you know, the, ask the, let the audience ask the questions to um, Carlos, who is the specialist of Nishitani. Any questions from like any specific, you know, historical questions? There are a lot of them in relation to Nishida to really, uh, if you have any questions that you know of Nish uh, Nishitani, uh, please share. Does anybody have any questions? Come on, I think you do. <laughs> meanwhile, I, I would like to, to say something about, about his style. Yes, yes I, well, it, I, it, it's very important to me to know the perspective of, of, of uh, Japanese people about how he, he writes, because I mainly read Nishitani on translation. So what's it in translation? So it's a different thing. But yeah, my perception is also that he, he, he writes better than, than, than Nishida or Tanabe. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember there's there's a comment that um, James Heisek makes in in Philosophers of Nothingness. He also he, he still um, argues that Nishitani's literary style is not precisely um, very strong. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Like there are, it's still a very difficult read, and it's not. It doesn't have the the, the literary style of someone like like James, like um, William James, for example. Mm-hmm. And I kind of understand that kind of judgment, but at the same time, well, it's more in some books than others, and some articles than others. But eventually, you find some passages in Nishitani, and not not a few, that um, that really linger in your head, precisely because of the. There, yeah, a few oh, expressions that kind of stays in your back of yeah. your mind. Yeah. And okay, I we think have it one has, questions, yeah. Carlos. Yeah, yeah. So we're gonna sure. point to Ramona. Ramona, uh, welcome to the philosophy Japanese philosophy talk, and please share your question. Thank you so much for inviting me and <clears throat> for the introduction to Nishitani. I have a question um, from um, let's put it this way, an existential angle, because. Um, in the 30s, when probably, um, I mean, you'll tell us more when exactly Nishitani started reading Nietzsche. Nietzsche was a big influence on, on French uh, philosophers in, um, I mean, uh, not only philosophers from France, but philosophers active in, in, in France at that, that moment in time. Um, especially, I think, a strand of religious existentialism that is earlier than Sartre's. Um, I work in particular on, on uh, someone called Lev Shestov, who was from uh, uh, Russia, emigrated to, to, to Paris uh, in 1921. And uh, I know his works were translated into Japanese at the time, but he, he was himself very marked by, by Nietzsche and had had a, a brush with Russian nihilism, <laughs> of course. I mean, he was... Mm in a sense, developing both strands, the Russian nihilism in, in parallel with, with, with Nietzsche. Uh, would, would you have something more to say about the way in which Nishitani read Nietzsche and whether he had um, contact with, indirect or direct contact with any other uh, European philosophers at the time that were interested in, in, in nihilism? I find this, this approach via the nihilist tradition really interesting well i from from his pages we know that that he read dostoevsky and he himself declares that he read dostoevsky and tolstoy when he was a teenager as well um he was very fond of bergson's philosophy i don't know much about bergson uh but i know that nishitani wanted to study with him he he had the he was awarded with a scholarship to study in europe Mm, and he wanted to study with Bergson. The problem was that it was 1936, around 1936, and Bergson was was very ill at the moment. And he was he was he he was a very old guy then, and so he, Nishitani wasn't allowed. He was recommended that he went to study with uh, Heidegger. So he ended he ended studying with Heidegger uh, from 1937 to 1939 in Freiburg. And back at that time, he once um, presented in Heidegger a text on um, Nietzsche's Zarathustra and Meister Eckert, which is a relation that many would declare impossible that, come on, like Eckert, the great Christian mystic, and Zarathustra, the killer of gods, or the, well, not the killer of gods, but the one who declares that God is dead, um, how can that be compatible? But uh, Nishitani found uh, um, a threat between them, and Heidegger considered. Well, it is said that Heidegger um, found it found it interesting, and so that that marks. Uh, I mean, that's an indicator of of how Nishitani read Nietzsche. He takes the 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 death of God very seriously. He takes the the the, the diagnosis, you know, Nietzsche's diagnosis of the problem of nihilism very seriously. But at the same time, he doesn't want to stop there and say religion is over. For Nishitani, um, nihilism and, and in general modernity is a kind of a purifying fire that uh, religions have to, to, to get across in order to evolve into a a new a new era a new form of development um and that that's a very key uh, that's a very fundamental point in in Nishitani's uh, philosophical career later on he engages with uh, Sartre 
in religion and nothingness is, is main work, for example. Uh, maybe not other existentialists, French existentialists, but uh, it is it is visible that that Nishtani was a, was acquainted with uh, with the existentialist philosophy, not only um, Nietzsche and um, and eventually some some Russian writers, but also with um, Sartre and um, French existentialists when they were writing back in the 40s and 50s. Yeah, the significant, maybe a, a few things is the characteristics of uh, Nishitani and Kyoto school reception of nihilism hmm. in the East Asian philosophical context would be, look, the Buddhism is starting out with nihilism. Uh, from, from our religious perspective, nihilism and a religious perspective are not uh, polar opposite, but it, it's a procedural mm -hmm. moment that you kind of have to go through nihilism to be able to understand the significance of religion. Um, for, so for yes. them, yeah, for them, it seems like uh, Nietzsche was the one of the most important philosopher. Um, so academics in, I don't remember exactly when, but the one, and um, I remember the, um, what does you wanted to write? Uh, dissertation on Nietzsche, right? And then he was rejected uh, because Nietzsche wasn't considered to be philosophical, but in the field, everybody was reading Nietzsche to say this is a really influential mm -hmm. uh, philosopher. So there's <clears throat> a lot to explore in terms of the reception of German uh, philosophy in the context of uh, Japanese academia. Uh, Ramona, do you have a, any follow-up question? Yeah, I mean, I was, I was thinking of the, um, the way in which um... Nishitani read Heidegger because obviously there was a, a polemic at the time between the, as I was saying, the earlier religious existentialists, um, um, the religious existential thinkers who were more influenced by Kierkegaard, for instance, and, mm -hmm. and, and Heidegger, who was mentioning Kierkegaard, but was sort of taking a, a more systematic uh, slant or, or a different understanding of being, which was not at all individual. So I was wondering whether, uh, I, I don't know enough Nishitani to, to comment, but I was wondering what, what you thought about um, the idea of, um, you know, picking up on, on, on nihilism, but from, from a very individualistic personal point of view, rather than in an abstract kind of sense of, nothingness that that Sartre then develops in in being a nothingness so what is um and and I'm thinking also of, of, of writers such as Osamu Dazai who, who also read uh read Dostoevsky and in in his autobiographical or semi-autobiographical novel also takes this kind of very nihilistic slant but from a from a personal point of view from an individualistic point of view which to my mind resonates very well with with both Dostoevsky and Kierkegaard if you see what I mean yeah. um so I, I'd be curious to, to to know how he then distilled you know what he got from both Nietzsche and Heidegger to form a personal view of well, the meaning of life and, and also what, what the individual, you know, that the role of the individual is in, in tackling these big philosophical questions. Hmm. I don't know whether it makes sense. I mean, it, it's, no, it's it, a very good I'm question, actually. Question, yeah. But... yeah, it's a very good question. Yeah, it, it, it raises a, an it raises several other questions, for instance, um, well, Nishtani quotes Kierkegaard, he knows Kierkegaard's philosophy. And for uh, for someone who just lands on on, on Nishitani's philosophy, you might well some people might might wonder why he chose to focus more on Nietzsche than on Kierkegaard, because is for Nishitani um, religion is a fundamental matter, and it can be considered like even his point of departure for philosophy, and for him existential considerations are, well, he, he has a, um, an existential reading of religion and, in philosophy, and philosophy in general. Why did he choose to focus on Nietzsche and not Kierkegaard? It seems a, a, not, a not choice. Well, by his own words, Nishtani claims that uh, Kierkegaard, unlike uh, Nietzsche, didn't um, develop and uh, study the problem of uh, modernity, uh, the problem of, uh, well, more precisely, the the problem of science to 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 the last consequences. That is, he didn't uh, go deep into the 
the problem hidden in the grounds of modern science that, that is mechanicism, which led to nihilism in the modern era. Um, still, I think that to a point, the fact that Nishtan is not so, so he does not consider Kierkegaard to such a great extent as Nietzsche, as Nietzsche. Well, that's a choice, that's a legitimate choice. But in a certain sense, I think that Kierkegaard's philosophy lingers in, in or is, is there in, in somehow in, in Nishtani's philosophy in a way that, that Nishtani himself does not recognize enough. Well, in my view, he's not fair enough to Kierkegaard and to the, to that, the, the depth of Kierkegaard's philosophy. That, that's something we can consider later, of course. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's a lot to say, but just, yeah. just to start. Yeah, I, I would ask some questions that are related to this. Uh, thank you so much, Ramona. Uh, I, now we have Andrew, and we have a couple questions on the chat. So let's go to the Andrew's question. Okay, uh, thank, uh, thank you for your answer. Actually, you sort of answered my question because I was going to ask uh, about uh, Nishidani's understanding of Kekagot because uh, I work on more on Wasuji and Wasuji uh, reject Kekagor very early, although he doesn't explicitly explain. We know why, because Kekagor was considered as a religious individualist for a long time. And from the modern study, we think this is a misunderstanding, but in, at the time when they haven't have access to the Kekagor's notebook and journal, we understand they can, they, it is fair for them to have this interpretation if we just look at his published work. Anyway, uh, but uh, there is another question because my understanding of Nishidani is that uh, is his uh, understanding of mythology, his uh, study on the nationalism and the Japanese religion. Uh, what is the influence of the German Romanticism on his idea of, uh, of myth? Because uh, when I read Nishidani's writing, I think his ideas is very similar to uh, Schnegel the German poet who argue for the legitimacy of myths in modern society. That's myths had a function to unite the nation. So uh, it's quite similar to Nishitani's uh, thought. What is the influence of German romanticism on his thought? Well, two points. First, Nishitani can also be considered a very individualistic philosopher. If we consider places such as religion and nothingness, and one of the first pages of the book, he declares that the, the characteristic mark of religion is that it is the individual, well, the first feature of religion is that it is the individual affair of each individual. Um, but I think that later you, 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 you continue reading religion and nothingness, you read other works and you see that, yes, um, I mean that's right from from Nishtani's viewpoint, and in a sense that 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 puts him close to to Kierkegaard, but at the same time, what an individual is is the result of um, the influence of the rest of reality on us. We are sustained by the rest of reality, so there's there is an intimate connection between the individual as individual and reality. Um. And I think that 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 would that would help to to address the second the, uh, to address your question. That's my second point, because yes, the influence of German idealism is huge, not only in Nishitani in general in, in Kyoto School philosophy. Um, and we can see, for for instance, how this this problem of uh, the dialectics between the universal and the particular is addressed um, in in Nishitani, and it has a lot to do with. Uh, with his readings of um, of Hegel and um, and I forgot I forgot the name now, but his um, Schelling. Sorry, Schelling. Yeah. Yes. M many other. And actually, among many other things. Yeah. Yes. He wrote he wrote several pages on on Schelling. I think they are, they're still untranslated. Mm. Um, and yes, from there, we can see that. Uh, Authors such as Nishida and Nishitani, well, Tanabe as well, take the problem of the dialectics between the particular and the individual very seriously, take the problem of the eye of the self very seriously. Uh, the interesting thing is they, they, they find in this an opportunity to discuss it in Buddhist terms. It's not strictly Buddhist philosophy. We could consider it better as a dialogue between Buddhist philosophy and German idealism, which then can be amplified to other 
other in other directions. I think in a way, I don't know if that if that's probably they didn't realize it much, but but I suspect that in the end this this was possible because in a sense German idealism was influenced by Orientalism. I mean, they were these people and people around them were reading uh, the Upanishads in translation. Well, a translation of a translation, that's right, but the in the, in the shaping of German idealism in, in, the, in the first uh, decades of the early um, of the early 19th century, the Upanishads in general, so several other Indian texts were being discussed. And, and I think, I bet it, it, it is impossible they didn't influence that, um, that relevance that they gave to the problem of the self and to the, the, the relation between the individual and the particular and the way they did. So I think it was a natural result that Kyoto school philosophers would uh, pay special attention to German idealism. I think I didn't talk about myth, but no, I think that there's a question that are related to it. So I'm I'm gonna Andrew, do you have okay. any follow up, or can we go to the yeah? No. Okay, so we come back to the question about myth because that's one of the most controversial topic mm. in relation to Nishitani. Uh, also, there are a couple other questions that are related to uh, Nishitani's reception of nihilism and specific historical period, or whether or not that question of nihilism is running through his entire work, something we have to talk about. But anyway, first question from Eduel Baker. Uh, so he has uh, two questions. So the first one is, the, are there any other Western philosophy that are influential or considered to be central to formation of central to the formation of Nishitani's philosophy. So in, besides, we have to talk about Heidegger, Nietzsche, Schelling. Are yeah. there any other Western philosophers that you consider, oh, Meister Eckhart, and are there any other? Uh, yes. Yeah, Western philosophers uh, that are considered to be central to his work. I think you answered the question very well. <laughs> yeah, those are, the, those are the main figures. <laughs> I think uh, there are. Yeah, those there are, are the main, many. There are many, there are many. Yeah. Also, there yeah. are many contemporary philosophers that are working with Nishitani in conjunction with other thinkers that are seems quite uh, implicit. Uh, yes. So we can we can further talk about this later. And then this is the second question from Ediot, and that is tied to <laughs> Andrew's question: Is uh, uh, how did the World War II impact? Uh, what's the the Second World War II's impact on the works of Nishitani? Uh, his work and how how he treated you know uh, post war trauma. Did he actually deal with the problems that are left in a post war Japan? I, I think uh, this is gonna be like two hours of discussion, but can you keep it? <laughs> the, yeah, the, well. you know the central uh, problem with the Nishitani's position in during the World War II, uh, as well as his treatment of the societal problems after after the war. Okay, so two things. Which, so which, which, by the way, which includes the question of myth a, a little bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, yeah, well, it's, it's, it's generally considered that Nishitani, Nishitani's intervention in, in the philosophical discussion during the war was very unfortunate. It's, it's very hard to, to, to argue otherwise because he somehow tried to, with others, he tried to to find a way to discuss with the militarists that were dominating Japanese politics at the time in order to persuade them to lead Japanese national nationalism in a direction different from war. But they ended up justifying war when it was at its, at its, at its most serious moment. So they had, his strategy was somehow like discussing with the with the extreme nationalists and the militarists at the time in their terms in order to persuade them in another direction. But he ended up being um, somehow dragged, dragged along with that with that uh, tendency. Uh, we could say, I mean, some people would even go as 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 far as declaring that Nishitani was in the end a kind of fascist or proto-fascist. But I, I strongly disagree with that. 
even though there are some some passages, for example, Heisig mentioned several some a few examples in in Philosophers of Nothingness, some passages that if you read them without context, you would say, well, this is this was a fascist. The fascist declared this. But I think the problem was precisely that. Nishitani was trying, and he always tried to discuss with others in their terms. And I think that's that's part of his Buddhist spirit. But probably in, in political terms, he was not keen enough um, to navigate through those difficulties. And um, that was that was painful to him in a way because once uh, the, the American occupation, the US occupation government was established in 1945. The next year he was declared unsuitable for, uh, for, for his position as a professor at Kyoto University. And he was there, he roamed without a university for several years until 1953 when his case was um, reconsidered. But interesting, during that time, he wrote several of his most important works. For example, his, his extensive work on nihilism was published in 1949. Um, and he, I think it was in 1947 when he published his work on Aristotle. Um, this is this is related to his to his to his treatment of myth. I think, well, some in, at some if you read some some passages in isolation, some people would try to make a connection between his understanding of myth and his understanding of the nation. And to a point, I I would say that not only Nishitani but in general Kyoto school philosophy and most of philosophy at the time was trapped into the nation state model. That is typical of, of uh, European modern nations in the from the 19th century onwards. But if you revise and, and, and critically analyze that problem and, and I steer away from that nation state model and consider those issues without the influence of such such model, so it should issues such as territory, the land, nation, collective identity, and myth. I think you find several important uh, intuitions and insights that are very important to, to understand. I mean, they're very relevant and help us a lot to understand our times in the 21st century. Um, there's a lot to say, yes, as, as Takeshi, Takeshi mentioned. Yeah, um, so uh, maybe I would add a few things, um, you know, the specifically the mythological language that use at the level of the state to justify the war weren't spoken uh, quite explicitly by Nishitani. So, the you know the language that right wing nationalist writers are writing at the time are not the language Nishitani would use to talk about the significance of myth. So it, it's it's a little bit of ambivalent um, position. And you're right that anything written in 1930s and 40s in Japan tend to have some passages that make us feel really uncomfortable for post war generations. But are they all categorically should be categorically labeled as right-wing nationalism um, is really up to question. And exactly. this is the precise yeah. of the reason why most people didn't even study uh, until recently. Um, yeah. you know, and only few in a that rare work on. Yeah. Mm. And I have more to say about this, but the uh, um, uh, we, we can talk about this later. Um, but- Just just a little, a little yeah, follow up, just- in general, when we consider those times the night from the 1920s to the 1940s, we, we need to understand that that was the language of the time. For example, uh, talk of race, that, that, that the very idea of race was part of the discourse of the public discourse in general. So mm. it would be quite unfair if we labeled all references to race as races just because it says race. It was a language of the time and people had to had to speak in those terms to be understood, like it or not. Uh, so we have to consider our judgments about that time very, very, very carefully because we, mm -hmm. we, we, we tend to read that time in retrospective and just you, we point at, at certain terms and say, oh, he said Nazi, he said race, he said this or that. So, well, that's fascist, that's fascist. This is Nazi. So we shouldn't read it. It's, it's quite, I mean, it, 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 is, it is very unfair in, the, in, in, in general terms. And it doesn't help well, us I was understand going to that say, time at our time. Yeah, there, I was going to say there's recently a publication on the Kyoto school and how it's imperialistic. I don't remember, but it was from the Sunni. Uh, 
it's a recent publication that still used this sort of categorical critique of Kyoto School as being uh, right-wing imperialist. And I was going to say a few and rare that being working on Kyoto School uh, is commenting on the chat right now. The uh, Yusa Michiko, uh, she wrote a really, really critical review of this book to show that this sort of categorical approach tends to take things out of context. So mm -hmm. uh, perhaps we can actually put the reference to these texts uh, on, on the YouTube uh, description later. So you'll be able to actually see uh, this discussion is still taking place, place today in 21st century. Um, I think most Kyoto schools uh, philosophy specialists, including Carlos, uh, would say that it's a, it's a little bit obsolete. Uh, we, we talked about this. Uh, but I mean, still a legitimate question is anything written in 1930s and early 40s in Japan should be labeled as uh, problematic. And uh, in fact, this is something that we talked about in relation to the history of Indonesia, uh, because the Indonesian educational discourses during the war, everything is bad. And that actually prevents us from studying the history correctly. So uh, we will provide more information about these things anyway. So for the question from Fio and Rare, uh, Yusa Michiko uh, on the chat, uh, he, she said about the nihilism, uh, Nishitani got ill, probably when he was 16 or 17. Carlos, do you know anything about that? And, yeah, he, uh, yeah. And that, that seemed to be the reason why he was interested in the question of existence rather than the question of nihilism. So that's the question from- uh, Yeah, Yusa I agree. Michiko. Yeah, by, by his own words, Nishitani, I would say that Nishitani landed on um, Dostoevsky and Nietzsche and, and such readings because of his, of his, uh, of his anxiety and his, his existential anxiety, not the mm. other way around. Okay. He found in Nietzsche, for example, several clues to deal with, with his nihilistic questions. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it had, it had a lot to do with, with his uh, disease when he was 16. Actually, he went... Because of that, he couldn't enter um, the high school he wanted at first. Mm -hmm. he, he, he presented the examination the next year and, and, and was approved. But first, he failed because of his health condition. But mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's just his health condition. In general, I think that he was very preoccupied in general with, with um, questions of meaning and what is the significance of this all. Um, and I think that has to do with the time where he was living a time when Japan was quickly becoming a modern nation. So in a sense, many people like him would have been feeling that the soil under their feet was crumbling and they were like in the, in the, in the need to rush desperately um, so that they could land on a new ground, the modern ground. Otherwise they would be left behind and probably mm -hmm. had a sense something a, that, that kind of sensation mm -hmm. and that is also very important in 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 the spirit of his philosophy and he that's also why he gives uh, a he gives great importance to the problem of mechanicism specifically mm -hmm. mechanism or mechanicism as the um, the root or a fundamental condition for the emergence of nihilism in the modern age which for him is the most radical form of nihilism in history. So he believes, well, nihilism is something that can occur. For example, we can detect it in the Upanishads. There is people then were dealing with the problem of nihilism, but modern nihilism is especially radical. In what sense? Because it doesn't leave any room in the structure of the universe for any uh, for, for the grounding of any, any form of sense or meaning or value. Mm-hmm. Okay, it so it's much more outreaching to the entire yeah. global global society, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah. Um, so Michiko is asking this another question. It seems like Heidegger comes in much later in Nishitani's personal sense of nihilism uh, or overcoming of nihilism. Uh, perhaps we can talk about a little bit of um, like historical break of Nishitani's works. How would you categorize them? And also... Um, how would you say the place of Heidegger in, in the works of Nishitani? Is that so important that everybody should read Heidegger in order for us to read um, Nishitani? Or is it one of the many characters that he handles and there's a sort of more like Nishitani? Because in, in case of Tanabe, 
Heidegger's position is very slim to me. I mean, he mentions and yeah. responds and all these, but it's always in passing. Uh, you don't have to read Heidegger to understand um, Tanabe. That's my take. But what, what, what would you say about this historical category mm -hmm. and place of Heidegger? Well, as for the first question, um, I think it's very hard to, to divide Nishani's work in period. Uh, actually, my advisor, uh, Professor Raquel Voso, um, claimed, uh, at least in his, his doctoral dissertation, she claims that um, the process is very organic and topics are connected one to the other. So it's very hard to, to, to decide well, when a certain period ends and another begins. But um, if we were forced to, to, to ask, the, to, sorry, to answer the question, I would say that um, we, might, we might say that there's a, an initial period in which one of the main topics is, is uh, what he calls elemental subjectivity or originary subjectivity. But that topic continues to be a, 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 uh, in other terms, fundamental to his philosophy later on. Anyway, that's explicitly so, I think, in the 1930s and 1940s, um, a period in which he also takes the issue of politics very seriously. Then, um, by the time of religion and nothingness in the 1950s, he starts considering religious matters more explicitly, and he forgets about politics, it seems. Um, and religion continues to be a, a a very important, a central topic for him in the 1950s and the 1960s. Um, there is a kind of transition period, we might say, in the 1970s, in a, a moment when he is um, um, discussing Buddhism more extensively. And uh, well, actually, no, there's no transition period, probably. I mean, in the, from the 1960s onwards, it seems that he, or an apparent, he apparently focuses mainly on Buddhist mm -hmm. um, matters, especially Zen. But I think that, that that allows him to develop several of the topics that were simply mentioned or not so developed in his middle period. But that, I, think, you know, yeah, years, but I think it, it's still difficult to, and to, we have to force uh, the, the continuity of his work a little bit in order to divide his work that way. Mm. So there's right. a sort of organic natural coherence throughout these work that are not clearly just yes. divided from the place on other, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, th I, st I think that we, 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 we better understand the development of his philosophy if we try to detect a certain thread that goes throughout the whole thing. And I think mm -hmm. there is such a thread. No. Uh, at the second, so, I know, forgot some, the second some, question. Yeah, some people would. Uh, uh, second question. No, the uh, <laughs> the place of Heidegger. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. How how would you say how important for us to read Heidegger well, in order to read Nishitani? It, that's an interesting question because actually, I have come to understand a lot of Heidegger by reading Nishitani. So it was the other mm. way around. Okay. But I wasn't a reader of of Heidegger. Um, but after talking and discussing several issues and discussing Heidegger with several colleagues, I've come to, to realize that probably I've understood much of Heidegger that way. And mm -hmm. actually, well, it's, it's something that because of, 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 of uh, duties, I, I couldn't do yet, but I need to read Heidegger more carefully. Mm -hmm. But, um, well, I think, I mean, it's important to a point. I mean, you, I think... I think that it is an advantage if you know Heidegger well, then proceed to read Nishtani, but at the same mm -hmm. time, it can be a disadvantage because you can see that um, very often Nishtani cites uh, Heidegger's terminology more than Heidegger himself. Mm -hmm. But he takes, he takes Heidegger, Heideggerian terminology his own way. He gives it a twist. And so mm -hmm. it's important to detect the nuances in meaning. Um, because you end up reading, he reading Heidegger into Nishitani and to an extent there are differences as well. For example, one, one which is very important is that Heidegger, Heidegger and, and, and Nishitani are allies in, in the, the relevance they give to the problem of technology in relation to nihilism. Yeah. Uh, but Heidegger, or as long as I know, maybe I'm wrong, 
Heidegger considers that there is no solution that we have, we, no solution that we have at hand. We just need to wait. That's all we can do. Patiently wait until conditions are different. Uh, but Nishitani believes that that is impossible. That once we realize that the problem of nihilism is a serious one, we cannot wait. It is like waiting patiently for resolution while we are inside a house in flames. No, we, we have to run out of there. Mm -hmm. We need to act fast. And so he is very, very keen and, and he takes a lot of effort trying to, um, to carve a way through nihilism in order to transcend nihilism. Okay. Yeah, so that's the place of uh, um, Heidegger in, 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 in terms of works of Nishitani. Now, next question, Onur. This question, what does the death of God mean for the Japanese philosophers of the time? Uh, because for Nietzsche, the God that is dead is rather the Judeo-Christian one, right? Uh, did the Japanese take the statement of Nietzsche universally? What about Japanese religion or Japanese gods? Um, so also, what do they accept with this notion of the, the death? What, what, does, what do they mean by God is the dead, the, the, the adjective part, predicate? What do they possibly mean by that? Well, in Nishitani, uh, mm -hmm. well, Nishitani considers that the, 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 the death of God is a problem for all religions, for religion in general. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's that's uh, the interpretation that he takes. And I, well, I think it makes sense. In, in, I think Nietzsche himself had this in mind. Not for another reason, he, he would write things such as, when, when he says, for example, um, the, the shadow of the Buddha would still linger on humanity for several generations. The Buddha, he says. Mm -hmm. I think that Nishitani like, it follows that connection that, that Nietzsche is, is, is making somehow implicitly. That when we say Buddha in Mahayana Buddhism and we say God in Christianity, we are pointing to somehow a similar direction. In different languages and with very different strategies, Buddhism and Christianity and in general all religions are pointing to what we could call today the transcendent. Mm -hmm. The notion that the, the meaning of life, the answer to all our, our, our most serious questions lies in, in, lie in, in, a, in a transcendental dimension beyond this very uh, mundane existence. We need to point in that direction. And the problem is the way that it is interpreted. So the death of God, I would say in Shitani means that such dimension is not available to us anymore because mecha mechanistic science presents us with a universe that is completely uh, inert. A, a, a universe that only obeys um, mechanical laws which are by that, by its own nature, by their own nature, um, indifferent, absolutely indifferent to our interests. So the mm -hmm. challenge for religion is how to re-encounter the transcendent, not beyond, and, and in a sphere beyond, but right here in this mundane world. I think there are, there are, there are several readings of Buddhism and Christianity, traditional readings that allow for that, for that, for that interpretation, for that new direction to religion. But, but it has to be done with the problem of, of uh, the mechanistic worldview and nihilism in sight. That's, mm -hmm. that's Nishitani's take on it. But, you know, the, for instance, Nishitani has this uh, uh, interreligious dimension uh, that he seems to be mm -hmm. talking about Mahayana Buddhism, but also he talks about Christianity and he's quite yeah. optimistic about both of them, no? Or would, yeah. you, would you say that they are just, in his mind, they're just the same thing? The Handu has the same religious dimension or different passages to the same consequences that he is trying to elaborate on? I, I think he's very sensitive to the differences. Okay. But at the same time, his sensitivity to the differences allows him to build bridges between both, both sides. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have to take both things in mind because much of debate about religion and the study of religion in, in our times, um, like um, swings between two extremes. Some people say, well, ultimately religions go in the same direction and they are uh, forms of the same message. Mm -hmm. And some other people would say, no, they are completely different. 
by the way, why do we use the same word to, to name them all? That's, that's arbitrary. That's mm -hmm. colonial and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that we lose something if we stick to one of the extremes. Yes, mm -hmm. we could say that all religions are definitely very different, but they are all, in a sense, we could say all religions uh, go to the same, go in the same direction, but each in their own way, in their very, in their own very different way. Uh, that's very hard to, to cope with. But no. I think that's the only direction available. And I think Nishitani follows that direction very seriously. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, short uh, note from Michiko that Nishitani's BA thesis was on shelling. Yeah, that is, that is true. Um, he actually worked on shelling in his, his year early on. And I think mm -hmm. a few people like Jason Worth, uh, some com comparative philosophy specialists from the United States have these texts on shelling and uh, Nishitani. So we can take a look at these things if you're interested. Uh, Nicholas Soderman, uh, if I remember correctly, in terms of the influence of German romanticism and its irrational side, so the kind of romantic you know, pathos of the things, it was particularly strong in 1930s in Japan through the influence of Japanese romantic school. Nishitani's views on society was at least in part in dialogue with this school. And Nishitani and the Kyoto School of Philosophers are kind of against the political positions prioritizing ethnic nations and anti-modernity that romantic school advanced. So can you tell us something about Japanese romantic school uh, and Nish Nishitani's and Kyoto School position? That's, that's new to me. Yeah, that's because, new well, to I, you. I, I know, yeah. So, yeah. well, I, I know, I, I knew there was a romantic school, but actually I, I haven't read them yet. Okay. So. Maybe I can rephrase this question uh, to something that uh, is something that I'm interested in as well. How does the right so the philosophy of nothingness or dialectic of nothingness the Kyoto School thinker is working on always criticize Hegel as being pan logistic, right? The pan rationalistic or whatever the word they use. Yeah. Um, that the kind of tendency to focus on human reason is a central locus in which you can handle this problem of nihilism, right? So they want to talk about a kind of pathos, right? So the, mm -hmm. how this negative term should be handled. There is constitutive elements and passions and feelings that shape our reality or something like that. How does Nishitani handle this question of pathos or the irrational. Does he talk about that? It's it's interesting because yeah, he in several passages he claims that we have to consider that yeah, rational the reason has its limits, mm -hmm. and there is something which is non-reason or beyond reason or irrational. He uses several terms, mm -hmm. but there's there's a point in, in religion and nothingness when when he claim when he, he puts this in another in other terms. He says, well, maybe there is a reason beyond human reason, mm -hmm. which is the reason of things. I'm, I'm rephrasing a lot. It's not exactly that way, just as I mm -hmm. remember it. Yeah. Uh, but it's there, I think, in chapter five of religion and nothingness. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an important clue because his point is not that, uh, well, there is the rational in here. We find the rational here and here we find the irrational. And those are two different things. Actually, I think I would interpret his words in, in, in rather in the sense that um, human reason has its limits and mm -hmm. we need to recognize those limits in order to save human reason. Mm -hmm. And human reason condemns itself when, he, when it proceeds without recognizing its own limits mm -hmm. uh, or believing that reason itself can find or, de or delineate its own limits by itself. So what's the function of reason in terms of, let's say, overcoming of nihilism or religion? Does he put the reason uh, in, in, in a kind of pedestal that it's the, you know, it, it is the important position for um, religious faith or what's the function of that reason? Yeah. Human reason is is uh, human reason does face the problem of nihilism initially nihility mm 
Like when, when reason, human, human, when human reason faces nihility and it faces nothingness, it recognizes its own, it, it, it is, it, it has a, a clear side of its own limits. But precisely okay. because of that, you cannot, I mean, once you face nihility, you know that you need to recognize it. You need, you need to go through it. Mm -hmm. But precisely nihility is that which negates um, the power of, of, of human reason. Mm -hmm. So there is no way that you use human reason in order to go through nihility. You need to get yourself imbued into nihility and that way find a, a path through, through nihility and land on, on, uh, on when, what, what Nishtani calls uh, the, the, the standpoint of emptiness. Mm -hmm. But even in a sense, it's not that you can get across nihility by yourself. Mm -hmm. you just let go of your human powers. And then once you let go of your own human powers, you, you, you give up your uh, um, imbued in need of control mm -hmm. nihility becomes emptiness the ab the absolute negativity of nihility becomes the absolute affirmation of of, of the whole of reality mm -hmm. long story i have short. a lot of questions about <laughs> that you know that for instance tanabe talks about how the overcoming yeah. of nihilism has to be done through the act of compassions right the act of love that it's no longer philosophical or reflections but it's actual almost like a social political actions that you do in a society yeah or even in home just doing helping other for their sake is, is enough to actually overcome the nihilism um, but in the Nishitani's framework it looks like there's framework of you know machination or this sort of like cybernetic nihilism that the whole society is set up in such a way that the, whichever way you think you're sucked into this nihilistic mechanism yeah. And once you recognize that, you'll be able to let go of it. But it, it, at the end, it seems like you come back to the way you are, right? So how do you, how do you behave after letting go of that human reason? Like, do we still act in the same way, but it's a different meaning? Or um, you would require a completely different kind of lifestyles or living? Uh, as long, well, maybe I, I need to read more, but... From what I've read, uh, Nishitani sure. doesn't seem very explicit about about uh, ethics in general. How do okay. we behave uh, from the viewpoint, or from the standpoint of of, of, of emptiness? Mm -hmm. um, there are some clues, for example, at the end of Religion and Nothingness, and in a, in a volume called in English on Buddhism, he discusses more extensively on social and ethical matters. Um, mm -hmm. But I still don't find like a very careful and extensive elaboration um, that, that, that allows us to, to answer from there the question, well, how do we behave? How, what, how, how ought we to do from the standpoint mm -hmm. of emptiness? Uh, in my perspective, Tanabe is more explicit in, in that sense and clear that um, the, the path to, to liberation is not only a matter of wisdom, of understanding things differently, but also of acting differently, and that is that is that is concretely that that, that has a concrete shape of compassionate action mm -hmm. in the social world. Yeah. Um, I still think that that Nishitani provides a lot of clues, and and we can discuss ethical issues from Nishitani's perspective. Yeah. Um, yeah. In a sense, in a sense, and I think Tanabe is very clear on this. They are, especially Tanabe, is 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 um, somehow reframing a, a very traditional discussion in Buddhist philosophy, mm -hmm. uh, the discussion of 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 action, precisely. Now, do we? I mean, is it enough that we pursue um, enlightenment or liberation, or maybe we should in and in, in in the confined in a, in, a, in, a, in a monastery? Or should he go to the world, go back to the world and act in the world? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, almost like we would have to reconstruct the political and ethical theory out of our reading of philosophy of religion and uh, Kyoto School Philosophers texts. Um, but at the same time, you, as you mentioned earlier, that they are not 
always uh, categorically divided into different topics. So for instance, Nishitani could talk about mm -hmm. Zen and aesthetics at the same time. It, it's yeah. not a problem for him to cross over the different boundaries. So if you read religion and nothingness as a strictly philosophy of religion text, uh, you might actually get confused, right? That, that there's the kind of this holistic organic element to yeah. his uh, approach mm -hmm. to topics of philosophy. Now, this is also uh, Michiko's comments on Nishitani's role in introducing Heidegger to Japanese uh, philosophers. So apparently uh, his, uh, so because Nishitani studied with Heidegger in Freiburg, when he came back to Japan, he published this introduction to Heidegger's talks, uh, published in the Eastern Buddhist. And apparently that is very helpful. Do you know this? text of Nishitani introducing um, Heidegger? No, I think I think not. Okay, but, uh, maybe uh, we can ask. Well, let yeah. me see. Uh, apparently, we'll have to find this uh, references, but yeah. uh, according to Michiko, uh, it's very um, helpful. And I understood better what Nishitani understood by Zen in that introduction as well. So there's a kind of a reception oh. of Heideggerian to the context of uh, mm -hmm. Japanese philosophy, but also his take on, on Zen, Zen Buddhism. So mm -hmm. uh, okay. Michiko, if you could find the references and share it with us, we'll be grateful. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> we'll try, thank you. I mean, if you can't do it right now, it's okay. You can send me a uh, send oh, yeah. me or Carlos yeah, sure. email, and then uh, we can share it through the Carlos Solasi and uh, an ENOJP outlook. And that's true. You're also based in 4 a.m., so that is uh, that is quite a challenge. Um, we will have to do some other time with perhaps with Michiko to do another talk on uh, someone else. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions? Otherwise, I would have some. Um, I, I was. I, I should have written down my questions. Any any follow up questions or comments? Anyone? I think there are comments in the chat. Yeah, that's what I'm going through. Okay. Okay. The latest one, Nicholas. Could Carlos please discuss Nishitani's understanding of elementary subjectivity, how that understanding developed in in the course of his work? So his concept of. Hmm subjectivity i guess the elementary subjectivity yeah okay i'll have to make an effort not to speak too long <laughs> <laughs> um we can we can but, we can go back to you can go we can go back to some of the earlier questions that probably perhaps yeah. ramona pointed out and also andrew touched on that how do we handle like subjectivity in, in a context of Kyoto school, for instance, this is a common, you know, almost, how should I say, hostile interpret misinterpretation of Nish Nishida. Uh, and then some argue that the, well, if you pay attention to Nishida's writing of the time, it, it has some point, but, you know, the Tanabe's critique of Nishida mm. was that, that it was too individualistic. Right. And then uh -huh. what is the critique of Western philosophy, Western ethics at the time was that it's based on individualistic self-consciousness, right? And then Nishitani developed his theory, uh, Tana, Nishida developed his theory to say, no, I'm not individualistic, individualistic at all. Like if you actually pay attention to what I'm saying, that's not what I'm doing, right? Now, Nish I, as far as I know, Nishitani took a little bit of Nishida's side whilst yeah taking into account some of the problems that Tanabe pointed out, right? Yeah. And also Nishitani worked with Watsuji. So he had to be aware of this whole question yeah. of betweenness and intersubjectivity. So to repackage Nicholas's question, um, where do we locate Nishitani in this debate on individual, individual elements or intersubjective elements? I think that if we consider his it's not only um, from his uh, uh, early earlier focus on elemental subjectivity or originary subjectivity. In yeah. other places in his work, we find a, a, a position that would be 
label that we could be tempted to label as individualistic because for him it is the question of the self is it's a fundamental question what is the self what am i mm -hmm. it is a fundamental question uh, but i mean i what makes it not precisely individualistic is that in the end um the first he ends up answering that the ground of reality, the, the whole of reality and the, the manifold of, of, of phenomena and things lie in the ground of the self. So there is an intimate, a very intimate, the most intimate possible connection between the bottom of my being and the, mm -hmm. and the very bottom of things. Um, and in this, I think, that such an intuition is, 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 is there from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. We consider the word, the word which is translated as elemental or originary in Japanese, yeah. it, it is kungen teki. Mm -hmm. kungen. And that word already has the sense of root and ground, but the way he interprets those terms, root, ground, base, mm -hmm. uh, uh, terms that are everywhere in, in his work, yeah. we can see that his reading of those uh, of those uh, terms is a reading that passes through Dogen. He is his reading of those terms is based on Dogen, and I think Dogen is as influential in his work as Nietzsche or Heidegger, and probably even more. No. If I would, if I if I was forced to 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 answer, if someone asked me, okay, just choose one one author which is absolutely fundamental as an influence for Nishitani's work. And I would say Dogen, mm. not even Nietzsche. Nietzsche, he, he speaks explicitly about Nietzsche. But the thing no. is that Dogen guides the way he uses language, the way he interprets Western philosophy, the way that he addresses the problem of the self. And this mm -hmm. is important here. Why? Because he follows Dogen's notion that uh, precisely the the put in, in, in modern terms, the ground of, uh, of all beings manifests in the ground of my own being. So when I pursue the question of what is the self, I am at the same time pursuing the question of reality. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, Nishitani recognizes the, 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 the reality that we are all individuals, but at the same time, it is not over against the rest of reality that we become individuals, but precisely yeah. in line with the rest of reality, thanks to the, somehow uh, due to the grace of the rest of things, we mm -hmm. can be the, become, we can become the individuals, the unique and irreplaceable individuals that we are. That thing, I think that's a very powerful intuition. It's there in Dogen in some way, and Nishitani yeah. allows us a modern reading of it. So that somehow this individual self is, you know, granted or dependent upon something other than itself to be what it is, basically, right? Exactly. Yeah. So even if you claim that there is a certain individual ex experience of the subjectivity that is granted in something even more than itself to be mm -hmm. what it is, and that's it's a very common um, theme in a Kyoto school. Um, perhaps. Another question I could ask is that sort of a Nishidian pure experience line of thought, like including Dogen. So for instance, like a pure land thinkers from um, Shimran onwards uh, and including Tanabe, it seems like there is awareness that it's impossible for us to have this pure experience where we can go back to this fundamental self that is capable of recognizing its, you know, um, original affinity with the world as what it is. So even before the division between subjectivity and objectivity, and we fold it into this sort of nihilistic framework of thinking where we can never mutually understand each other, but in position of one or the other, Tanabe's formulation uh, in reference to the Pure Land seems to say that we can't really get out of it. Um, but somehow we can rejoice in this 
fallen state, basically, to use uh, Judeo Christian language. Um, so there's an inherent, like, sort of resistance toward this peer experience among the mm -hmm. pure land side of Kyoto school thinkers like the um, Takeuchi Yoshinori or, um, you know, Tanabe. Hmm. How does Nishitani talk about that experience of, does he something somehow have this, I wouldn't say optimism, but it's a sort of um, awareness of the hospitality of the environment or something like that. The world is set up in such a way that we should yes. be able to feel this sustenance yeah. from the world or we're so messed up that there's no way for us to be able to actually recognize that. And that's the beginning of um, redemption, according to Tanada. Interestingly, even though, even though he is firmly grounded on Dogen, I would insist, and he also discusses Shindan and Pure Land Buddhism. And, and well, at least in my experience, my reading of Tanabe and my contact with Pure Land Buddhism thought has helped yeah. me to understand some points of Nishitani's better. Mm -hmm. um, to put it short, I think that definitely we understand better Nishitani as, a, as another power philosophy than as a self-power philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that, that at first. And second, I, we find several, several instances in which uh, Nishitani um, tends to that same um i mean he 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 would agree with tanabe in general in saying it is here in a very concrete world in this very concrete world that mm -hmm. we um can be in contact with emptiness this very world mm -hmm. world of ordinary life which first starts as problematic this very world is the world of emptiness um which in Shindan's language, for example, could be expressed as um, the pure land is manifest by faith, by means mm -hmm. of faith, the pure land is manifest here in this very concrete world. Okay, yeah. And definitely, I would, I would say Nishitani, Nishitani is insistent on that point in, in other terms, mm -hmm. of course, but, no. but that's his point, yeah, that the beyond of, of, of emptiness is, mm. I mean, the far side of emptiness is actually nearer to us mm -hmm. than which, whichever we could consider near to us. No. Oh. So Michiko is pointing out the fact that the, we should differentiate these two terms as the individual and so single individual in, in, in metaphysical term or philosophical term or sociolinguist uh, linguistic term and then self in the context of Kyoto school. Um, I think that is true, but um, I have a question in relation to this distinction and which relates to this discussion of the position of the individual. So look, the Mariyama Masao and all the other anti-Kyoto school thinkers would argue that the Kyoto school notion of self is not individualistic enough to be able to account for the individual responsibility and freedom and they don't represents this um, modern notion of subjectivity that it's self-awareness and in the individual that becomes responsible for its own action and autonomous self. That's the modern European conception mm -hmm. of um, self as a in single individual, the individual subjectivity. Uh, in the context of Kyoto School, just by the fact that we have to differentiate between the two. So some mm -hmm. other critics of Kyoto School say that it's not individualistic enough. Why the self, the self seemed to be this encompassing non-self that is not me, mm. uh, that is operating somehow beyond us to be able to make us who we are. Um, do you think that is a fair critique of Kyoto school or that's just completely misreading of Kyoto school or including, it, especially it, in relation to Nishitani? I the, think it's unfair, emotions? yes. Unfair, okay. In general, yeah, because I mean, at least in thinkers such as Nishitani, we find precisely that he 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 wants to recognize that he, the 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 reality of individuality, and he's mm -hmm. very clear. He he very clearly uh, explains what individuality means. Mm -hmm. it says an individual is an individual in terms of being irreplaceable, unique, the unique and irreplaceable entity that it is. Mm -hmm. That is being an individual. 
Mm -hmm. uh, self is what the thing is by itself. Uh, well, poorly explained in this point, but well, uh, the the thing is, yeah, I think he he recognizes the the conceptual distinction. At the same time, he he wants to 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 give full recognition to individuality and to the need for individuality in human life. Mm -hmm. At the same time, he wants to give full recognition to the fact of interdependence, of interrelationality. Mm -hmm. And precisely the harmony between the two is uh, provided by the, the, by Dogen, we could say, but that intuition can be traced back even earlier to Huayan Buddhism, for example. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the idea is an individual is the individual it is, not just in opposition to reality, but thanks to the interrelational nature of reality. Mm -hmm. and that is very, and that is explained in, in full detail in Huayan philosophy itself. Mm -hmm. And I think Nishida and Nishitani follow that track, that, 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 uh, that same path, consciously or not. Mm -hmm. They use the same vocabulary and that's not an accident. I think they're following that logic. Mm -hmm. And so probably those who claim that, for example, Nishitani is not individualistic enough, they, they do it from a position that claims that the individual can only claim its own individuality in opposition to the okay. rest of reality. And uh, the problem with that viewpoint is that if you, if you go further, what you end up causing is a disconnection of the individual from reality. And in that way, the individual um, destroys it, the grounds of its very individuality because the ground for that is the rest of reality. And mm -hmm. you end up in things such as the, um, the policies that were implemented in Sweden, that um, <laughs> okay, those, you know, those policies were inspired by that viewpoint that every individual needs to sustain themselves and, and so they can, the state must provide each person with uh, the conditions to be an individual a fully autonomous individual. So they give funds to kids when they were, once they, they were, they turned 15 so that they could live on their own um, and leave, leave their parents' house and live on their own. Mm -hmm. And the, the, what we, what, what, the, what the situation is in Sweden, as long as I know, is that many people feel lonely. And that's probably just a radical example of, of what, what, what's, happening in many westernized or western societies japan included individuals mm -hmm. feel deeply lonely mm -hmm. precisely because the connections between individuals have been severed mm -hmm. and the paradox is that precisely in those conditions the individual feels alienated yeah i think it's, it's the same the same way that Ichikawa Hakugen, for example, addresses the critique of Nishida's philosophy. He claims, no, these guys are, are all in with um, a Huayan logic, and that's why they cannot assume the standpoint of the uh, autonomous and uh, self-responsible individual. But I think it's the other way around. Mm -hmm. We see in the history of Buddhist thought, what we find is that precisely what grounds our responsibility as individuals is our responsibility to others. And yeah, we have a responsibility yeah. to others because of the co intimate connection between, uh, between yeah. us all. Yeah, that would uh, lead to some other questions that I have, and hopefully some members would uh, jump on this topic, but uh, Nishitani with environmental philosophy or philosophy of nature mm -hmm. in that regard. I mean, you're working on this project of um, Japanese philosophy and indigenous uh, Colombian philosophy, right? Mm -hmm. the, the um, unrepresented indigenous philosophy in Colombia and how that can have very interesting interrelations between, or the dialogue between, for instance, your Kyoto work on a Kyoto school philosophy and your investigations into the history of uh, uh, indigenous philosophy in Colombia. But do you think well, first of all, can you tell us more about that? Like what motivated you to extend this philosophy of religion in Nishitani to enter into the realm of philosophy of nature? And can you tell us more about this project? Well, 
precisely noticing the 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 influence of high and thought in through Dogen in in mm-hmm. Nishtani's philosophy um, caught my attention to to the the issue of the relation between the individual and the environment. And Nishtani is very explicit in 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 when he discusses this in relation to the land, for example. The way mm-hmm. the land also shapes the way a community is, and the way the community also uh, provides life to to the land, the the intimate connection between both sides. In 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 a certain way, then you you can notice that uh, in Nishtani, um, the individual, the community, or the nation, we could say, and the land are are uh, intimately connected with one mm-hmm. another. Uh, interestingly you can find such connections and such intimate connections in the way certain Colombian indigenous nations think about the world. Mm -hmm. They don't say land, they say territory, but uh, there's an example in the Nasa and the Misak peoples. They they usually um, configure their public discourse in terms of uh, of territory. But Mm -hmm. territory is not simply a physical piece of land. Territory is something which is uh, also constructed by the action of a community. The community acts in the territory and by acting in the territory, they also help give shape to the territory that provides them with all the conditions for life. Mm -hmm. I think it's very interesting that all of this is also in in a way discussed of of course in in, in very different terms in Nishitani. He discusses this issue of the, the way the land provides the, the community with all the conditions to live. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, each individual in the community has its own individuality, mm-hmm. precisely because of that. So I think there is, there is much that can be, that can be said in, in some, a lot that we can contribute to environmental philosophy in general, mm-hmm. if we engage in this dialogue. Uh, yeah. And also, it could help to 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 make to make the the discourses of NASA or MISA communities more more visible to the world at large. And I think sure. that's can a you, very... can you spell their name? Can you spell? Uh, their yes, name? I I can write them in the chat. It's NASA, mm-hmm. and uh, yes, <laughs> NASA, and MISA. Wow, MISA. Yes, they live in in uh, in a part of Andean Colombia, part of the Ande the Andes. Um, mountain range mm-hmm. called Cauca. Yeah. So Cauca. are you saying that the, the, the these uh, uh, Misak people and the Nasa people are not territorially bound to the land as like here is the national boundaries and we claim this territory to be our you know home ground mm-hmm. but they have a very different sense of territoriality that's what you say just 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 uh, clarify for them I mean the issue I have to explore more, of course. I have to, to study this more deeply, but uh, I mean, they have, they seem to have a, a clearer sense of, of boundaries than, than in other indigenous nations. For example, in the Amazon basin, the issue of boundaries is, is much, much more vague. There is not a, even, for example, it happens among the Tucano and several Tucano nations in the Amazon or the or the Witoto nation, which live in the borders between Peru, Brazil, and Colombia. For them, mm-hmm. borders are non-existent. Yeah. They don't care about borders. In, yeah. in the case of the Nasa and Misak people, well, the issue is more relevant because they live in a territory traditionally occupied by, by powerful landlords. So mm-hmm. they have to claim boundaries. Yeah. But, uh, but what makes the territory is not the boundaries themselves, but the relation of the people to the land. Mm-hmm. The way they act on the territory, the way they 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 act on it, not only by 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 tilling the land, but also by walking and sharing words mm-hmm. between the different the different towns, yeah. among the different towns. It's interesting because in Logic of Species by Tanabe, he has this whole section where he talks about territoriality principles that in order for the specific group of people to thrive, they need to have a piece of land. And there's a limitations to how many people can be on that place. So the solution to the problem, you say, it's like our capacity to actually build tall, like vertically, like Hong Kong, so that we don't have to uh, <laughs> depend upon the size of the land, that we have to technologically overcome that um, 
you know, the, our in, sort of chain is to the land. But I mean, modern technology nowadays is moving to the opposite directions. And at the same time, it's just dealing with these, um, uh, you know, like for instance, the Andrew was talking about how we shouldn't be too critical of Kyoto school in 1930s and 40s, because, you know, if they spoke up, um, they would have some political social consequences into his family, right? And then he's from Hong Kong, mm -hmm. Macau, so you understand the yeah. cultural context of that, speaking too freely, yeah. right? Um, and then we have this whole current event developing in Palestine, uh, Israel and Palestine conflict about whole lands, the borders that we have to claim to be able to actually live. Uh, but it seems like your yeah. environmental philosophy is touching on that issue of how do you uh, handle this relationship between humans and lands? Yeah. Um, why did you think that it was a really the direction that you should take with this Kyoto School philosophy or Nishitani in this regard? Yeah, I didn't understand the question. Why, why, why did you take this? You know, I just introduced that you're working on Kyoto School philosophy yeah. and philosophy mm -hmm. of nature, but mm -hmm. what prompted you to make that motion? Like this is okay. the, yeah. I, I don't think I remember clearly in which moment I, I, I was driven in that direction, or exactly why. But I, I definitely believe that, uh, again, the noticing the influence of Hawaiian thought especially mm -hmm. Hawaiian thought through Dogen in Nishitani yeah. led me in that direction. So first it was an interest in the, in the environmental dimension of Dogen's philosophy. Mm -hmm. But then I, I, I saw that it had everything to do with Nishitani, especially because, well, definitely, I think the thread that links all the parts of Nishitani's philosophy and Nishitani's career as a philosopher have to do with, with notions provided by Dogen. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's not only that he uses Dogen's terminology, but he that Dogen. I mean, the reading of Dogen is a guide for him to navigate through different philosophical problems and the lenses through which he reads Western philosophy. And I think it has a lot to do with that. Probably not the only. It's surely not the only element, but I think. Well, in my view, if we see the commentaries, the the different the second literature on Nishitani, at least in Western languages, I think that's usually misregarded. It's, mm -hmm. Or so it seems, because it's not not deeply discussed. We have a lot of literature, for example, on Nishitani and Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. Evidently, that's very relevant. Nishitani and Heidegger. There mm -hmm. is a passing reference to the influence of Hawaiian philosophy on 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 Kyoto School philosophy. At least one article, maybe a little, maybe a few more, but not many more. Yeah. But then a deep discussion on Dogen in Nishitani's philosophy is something yet to be done. And yeah. I think that that would led me to, to, to consider that yes, environmental philosophy was a very important element to, to explore in Nishitani. I see. And it is a really depressing problem in, in, in not only in philosophy, but also in politics. And you know, yeah. the fact that we're going through this pandemic or also testifies our, you know, really hostile relationship to the world right now. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. Well, Carlos, uh, we are almost at uh, time um, because we always do the hour and a half and we started a little late. So I had to close this session. Um, do you have one last statement before I close? Um, I would like to ask you, which book should we read if you're going to explore Nishitani for the first time? For the audience. If it's for the first time, I would definitely oh. start from religion and nothingness. Religion and nothingness. But then I would say if if you read religion and nothingness and you definitely believe, okay, this is this is something interesting, I should I should read more, then you mm -hmm. definitely need to read more. Because religion and nothingness has a lot of elements, contains a lot of elements in Christianity's philosophy, but not all of them. Mm -hmm. So it's still, if you put it in a, in a broader context and you read other, other uh, you read more stuff and you can mm -hmm. see, you can make sense of a lot of what is, uh, is there in the book and not fully, not fully explained. Probably you, you, you can end up having a lot of questions uh, once you finish religion and nothingness. But I think many of those questions are clarified in other parts of his work. Okay, so uh, let's start with the religion and nothingness and then branch out to different texts to handle some of the questions that come from that book. 
Okay, mm -hmm. so hopefully Religion and Nothingness will become one of the best sellers next year uh, because of so. this <laughs> Japanese philosophy talk. So th thank you so much, um, um, Carlos, again, it's been, I, I had a few online talks like this with you and it's been always a great pleasure and intellectually stimulating. And so thank you so much, everyone. This was the Japanese philosophy talk number two on Nishitani Keiji with Carlos Balbosa, co-organized by uh, ENOJP and Kelas Isolasi. So if you're interested in uh, more talks about Japanese philosophy in general, uh, you know, first of all, make sure to follow Carlos on Twitter and all the social networks that where you can see his work, uh, but also follow us on Kelas Isolasi and ENOJP uh, YouTube channels. So we will be broadcasting these uh, videos. So on that note, we'd like to close uh, this session. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you, Bye. Carlos.